All righty. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. How are we doing? Great. Are there any questions or comments before we get started on today's material? Oh, hi. Um, I wanted to ask, so this Thursday, I'm busy at 9 to 10 for my Thursday office hours, and I wanted to, like, ask the class if anyone has, like, a preference, if they would, like, same time on Wednesday or like earlier on Friday. Um, if anyone in the class has like a preference, I can like type out potential candidates. Um, I already have the office hours from 9 to 10 a.m. on Wednesday, so I'm not sure if people still want it on Wednesdays, but Fridays I can do like any time after 12, like 12 to whatever for an hour. Wednesday, 9 to 10 p.m. I can actually do both too. So I can first do 9 to 10 p.m. And then um, if people want, I can do one like Friday from 12 to 1 as well. But okay, yeah, thank you for that. It's just for this week. So I'm just gonna type it out. Um, I'll, I'll send an announcement instead actually, but just for this week, instead of the, um, Instead of the Thursday 9 to 10 p.m. office hours, I'm going to change them for Wednesday to 9 to 10 p.m. for now, and then potentially a Friday one if people need need help. Yeah, that's all good. Thank you. You're welcome, Chair. Does anybody else have something you want to say? Okay, then. Um, Let's get started. So <clears throat> we are getting to the point where uh, the first midterm is coming up. So it's going to be using Zoom, and it's going to be the week, the week of uh, October twenty-fifth. Uh, so there'll be slots. You're not yet posted, but slots uh, will be posted uh, on Canvas. Um, and then it's first come, first serve. Uh, the slots, the uh, 20 minutes. So this is, I'm going to get this set up either today or tomorrow, and then I'll send out an announcement when they're available. And then uh, you just send me, um, you just email me your choice. And then I'll update it on Canvas as I get more and more emails. Uh, so it'll be, It'll be doing that Tuesday lecture, but we will need more slots than that because I can't fit everybody into the three hour slot. Um, so there'll be uh, a couple of days uh, for you guys to, uh, to choose from. And when we get closer, we'll start talking about how, um, how these all exams are you're, you're going to go. So that week uh, around October 25th. The other thing, uh, yeah, so today, uh, today we're going to have two parts again. Right, so today we're going to have the first part. We're going to do um, uh, conditional expectations. I mean, we need the stuff here from Martin Gills. This is why we're doing it. And then the second part. We're going to go into hall. Uh, this is going to be um, uh, the credit. Last time we talked about swaps, so this time we're going to talk about the credit default swap. If you have time, we can also talk about baskets, uh, CDOs, and so on. But the CDS, this is like the analog uh, of the uh, the swap that we talked about last time, but now 
there's credit default, so uh, it's not risk free anymore. So that's what I had in mind for today. And I know these conditional expectations. This this is uh, some of you already pointed out last time. But it, this is pretty abstract. And um, I put some sections in there on the on the schedule where you can read more about it. But I'll go through some of it now uh, over the next hour, hour and a half, and we look at some examples, and then hopefully it clears it up. Like the if <clears throat> when you talk about a random variable, so just the starting point, right? You take a random variable, a random variable, uh, let's call it x. It's a function, right? So it's a function. This is what it means. This is a function. When you write x going from omega to r, this here, this is a function. So what makes a function a random variable? Well, that feature is it's a function that is measurable um, with respect to, say, f. What does it mean to be measurable? So it's a random variable. Uh, so it's a function. This a random variable is a function that is measurable with respect to it. Okay, so what does it mean? Well, if this is our sigma algebra that we talked about last time. So, <clears throat> so if is a sigma algebra and uh, I want X to be measurable with respect to it. So it means that when I'm looking at these sets, uh, those omegas in the domain, such that when I plot the omegas into eggs, I look at the level sets, these things here, they belong to F. They belong to F for any X in R. But so the example we had last time is, if I would take F to be, the smallest sigma algebra that the first two coin flips generates. But then we could have the random variable X. Uh, the random variable X uh, could be, um, uh, what could it be? It could be uh, like the strike, or we looked at something like five minus and then the stock price, so the stock price will be S zero and then the product of the two. So this would be a random variable that satisfies that it is measurable with respect to, um, to F. Like this one here, this would be our stock price at time two. In this multiplicative binomial model. What we also see here is that we should note here that, that X is not uh, measurable with respect to um, the sigma algebra just generated by the first country. Sigma is not measurable with respect to just this guy. So the, the interpretation is that, um, so the, the interpretation is that X involves uh, S2 and, um, and for X to be measurable, we need, uh, we need both uh, we need both coin flips. We need both both coin flips, uh, psi one and psi two. <clears throat> so uh, the name of the game is going to be. So we have our we have our sigma algebra. We have a random variable. Now what we want to do what we want to do today 
Today, we're going to be looking at conditional expectations. Conditional expectations. So we're going to be looking at conditional expectation of X given G, where G is inside F. So what is this object here? Well, we will just recall again that if I take, if G here is the smallest sigma algebra that there exists, that was the one we talked about last time. So that's the empty set and omega. Then the conditional expectation just becomes the expectation. Right, and we know how to compute this. So if um, if uh, if x has density, uh, say that we call it density f. Well, if x has a density f, well then uh, this expectation of x, you can write that out as an integral. X takes values x take values over in R. So we're going to be integrated over R. And then you have an x here, and then you multiply onto the density f of x dx. That's our expectation. So in this particular trivial case, uh, where the uh, sigma to be conditional on, the expectation, the conditional expectation is just nothing else than the, um, the integral with respect to the density. What happens if, um, in our case, um, in our case, uh, if if uh, x uh, takes uh, values uh, x n with probability probability, what would it be like? Um, Pn, so this is the probability uh, that x equals xn. <clears throat> well, then the expectation of x is going to be, it's not going to be an integral anymore, but what you'll have to do is you'll have to take x, the value that it takes, times the probability, and then sum them. Uh, these are the typical two cases that we're going to be facing. This one here, this is a the typical uh, example that we will face. And uh, this is in 622. Uh, and, and in our case, this is the typical situation that you will have in 621. That being said, I have put some problems. I also have prepared a few examples here in this topic. This is what happens when the sigma algebra that you condition on is trivial. So what is the general? <clears throat> so there is, how, how is, uh, how is uh, EX given G defined for a general uh, G inside F? But this is this is tricky, and this is tricky. So, so the the official definition is the official definition is that uh, this object here, y, which is a random variable, is a is um, is a conditional expectation. It's a conditional expectation of X given G if, then there are two properties. So the first property is, the first property is that uh, Y is 
a G measurable. Right, so that's the definition we have right here. And these sets here, we have to be inside G now. Right? So the definition here is that if I look at the set of omegas such that Y of omega is less than X, these sets belong to G and for any X in R. So that was the first one. And the second one is the harder one. Um, y satisfies, Y satisfies the uh, partial averaging property. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that if I take the expectation, if I take the expectation of Y times an indicator for a set, uh, say G, this is equal to the same thing as if I took the random variable X here and the indicator over G. Now this is true for any G in the sigma algebra, capital G. And here the, the indicator, let me just recall where the indicator where this one G, this is a random variable, go from omega to R. This is defined by one G of the point omega. This is defined as one if uh, omega belongs to G and it's zero else. Right, so this, these two, this is the general definition of a conditional expectation. For us, we don't need it in such full-blown generality. For us, and this is this example here, very often, uh, so for us, for us, we'll have, um, we'll have um, this sigma algebra G, is typically generated by, so I shouldn't say we have, we often have, we often have that G is the sigma algebra generated by these coin flips. So psi one, psi two, or to say psi n, these guys are Bernoulli's. And then, then the, um, then the conditional expectation E of X given G, right? That's gonna be one of those Y's that we have in here. So the conditional expectation satisfies these two properties. We will have that this here is equal to uh, some function of these psi one, psi two, all the way up to psi n. For some function, So if he goes from R in to R, right? And so different X's, different X's, uh, they give different, give different functions F. And maybe we should do an example here. <clears throat> we already did an example last time, but maybe we should, um, we could do an example that is more specific. If we looked at um, this one here is related to, to what you had in your home. Maybe before I do the example, are there any questions so far? A bit more abstract than, than perhaps what we've been used to, but yeah, we have to get through this uh, conditional expectation material because we need these martingales and martingales there to use these conditional expectations here. So this can seem very abstract, but let me try to make it more specific. Um, if we take, 
So take two random variables and we make them Gaussian. We make them Gaussian. So let's do a more specific example. So let's take two, two Gaussians. So I'll have uh, X. Uh, X and Y, two dimensional, and you're gonna be Gaussian. So you write this here. So Gaussians are characterized by means and covariances. So we will have uh, the means, I'll put them to be zero. And that's the mean vector. And then the covariances. So over here, I'll put the covariances. I'll put the variance on the diagonal. And then after the diagonal, I'm gonna put a row. So these are the means. So X's mean is zero, Y's mean is zero. X's variance is one, Y's variance is one, and the covariance is gonna be row. So this is the variance covariance matrix. Variance. Covariance uh, matrix. So the two dimensional Gaussian. And so what we have is um, uh, so X is Gaussian, mean zero, variance one. Y is Gaussian, mean zero, variance one. And they also happen to be jointly. So we'll call the Asian parameter rho. Okay, so we have, uh, so what we could be interested in if, if I compute the mean, if I compute the mean of X, right, I'm gonna get a zero. And if I compute the mean of X given X, right, then we go back to the definition. If, if if uh, I have something over here that includes X itself, well, I can just use X as my Y, right? because in that case X is already gonna be measurable. And of course, if I can take X to be Y, then it satisfies the same property. So if I, if I condition here on X, I'm just gonna get X. All right, so the more interesting case is I'll have these two, but what about, what about if I take X and then condition on Y? Well, what it's gonna be is it's gonna be a function. So, so we need a function. So, so we need to be looking, be looking for, uh, for a function. If in this case is gonna go from R to R such that the conditional expectation of X given sigma of Y is exactly F evaluated at Y. So what kind of a function is F here? What is F? Any guesses, any thoughts? If I take two Gaussian random variables, jointly Gaussian, if you have a mean zero, variance is one, correlation rho, and I take one of them and I condition on the other one, what do I get? What should the condition expectation be? Right. So the, the, the thought process that goes into this is like, you get to observe, you, this is what we observe. You observe Y and then this quantity, the big condition expectation, this is gonna be our, this is here is going to be our. Uh, this is going to be our estimate of x uh, given y, and y is what we observe. Right, so the first one, I don't want to observe anything. 
So what's my best estimate? So my best estimate is just going to be the mean, which is zero. And then in the second one, I get to observe X. Okay, so if I get to observe X, what's my best estimate of X? Well, that's going to be X. And then the third one is the trickiest one, right? So I get to observe Y, and I know that Y and X be correlated. So given that I observe Y, what is my best estimate of X? Well, it's going to be some function of Y, but what function? Let me try to see if you can get this to work. And the name of the game when you're looking for when you're looking for such functions is more or less always the same. Um, we're going to see if we can decompose. This is our fundamental idea, and it works really well in basically all uh, all the calculations that we're going to be doing throughout uh, this course and also in your homework. This is the idea that is always there. <clears throat> what you do is you decompose. You decompose X into two parts. The first part, so this is part, uh, part one, is independent of Y. And then part two, is uh, measurable with respect to y. And that's how the name of the game is. You always need to do this. Uh, this you don't need to do it, but this this way of uh, attacking uh, attacking the conditional expectation. This this is going to work for lots and lots of problems in uh, in this course. Um, so <clears throat> how do we decompose? How do we decompose X into two parts? Well, how do we do it? Well, let's try to write X here. I want to write X here as, say, a coefficient. So let's give this a shot. Try to write x as try to write x as a coefficient, say a times uh, times y plus something orthogonal. Right. So this first part here, this first part here, this is going to be measurable with respect to y. It's a constant times y. So this one here. This is going to be measurable with respect to uh, this is our part two. Right in this one here, this is going to be the thing that's independent. This is part one. And then see if we can find, can we find so so can we find such can we find such a's and y perpendicular? Okay, so how should it be? Well, the y perpendicular. We just solve this equation here. This is the same thing as saying that y perpendicular. This is going to be x minus, and then this coefficient that we're trying to find times y. Right? And we need this thing to be independent of y. Okay, so then we need a result, a result uh, from uh, Gaussians. If uh, so two joint regressions so two jointly uh, Gaussians uh, they are independent uh, if and only if uh, we have um, zero correlation. I'm hoping that you guys have seen stuff along those lines. If not, let me just show you a place so you can read more about it. All right, so if you look at Steve Shreve, uh, this is the second volume. This is the second volume. So let me try to show you in here where, where you can find something that will help you. With this, uh, with this result. So flip over into uh, multi-dimensional normals. 
So something here with normal random variables on correlated and dependent, page 62, flip over page 62. Dependence. Right, so here we are. Here we're looking at <clears throat> here we're looking at a question like two random variables, x and y, are said to be jointly normal if they have this monstrosity as their density. Okay, so then we need to know uh, what is the connection between being independent and structures on the multi, uh, on the joint uh, density. And there should be a result in here somewhere that says that you're independent if and only if the density is the, the, the equal to the product. I don't think he has that over here. So this is what he's saying. The following conditions are equivalent. So you have independence, right? and then he says that the joint density factors, so the joint density is equal to the product. And um, if you look at this joint density over here, so when is that equal to, when is that joint density equal to the product of the two standard normals? Well, so the standard normals, you have mu's that are equal to zero. All right, so this thing here, when is it equal to uh, the, the two, uh, the product of the two standard normals? Well, this happens exactly when rho is equal to zero, right? And rho is the correlation. So from this definition two to 11 and that result we had earlier about the uh, equivalence between independence and the joint density being uh, equal to the product of the marginals, uh, this is, you're going to get this property here. This is absolutely not true. Uh, this is not true uh, for general distributions, right? So this is just a warning. I've seen students make mistakes on this a few times. This is just a warning, so we put it in red. And this is not true. This is not true uh, in general. Uh, and it's not true, you also, this is not true in general, and it's not true uh, without uh, the joint, without the word joint uh, Gaussians. Right, so in other words, X and Y can be Gaussians and this fails. You have to be joint Gaussians. It's not sufficient. It is not sufficient uh, just to have X and Y Gaussians. You need to have them jointly Gaussians. So I've seen students make mistakes on this both in uh, in class, but. But more troublesome, I've also seen them make mistakes about this um, out uh, interviewing for jobs. And, and then this is this has been one of those questions that employers would use to screen, like before we all use Zoom or be phone interviews. And so you will have um, you will have people from HR call up in the first round, and you will take the students through uh, some of these uh, probability questions. And one of them was. Uh, stuff of this sort, like if I have two random variables, are the uh, is there equivalence between uncorrelated and independent? And then the students would say no. But the problem would then be that when you started digging down, there was this word joint that was missing. So it is it's not okay just to say that this is true if x and y are Gaussians. That is incorrect. Uh, you can have uh, uncorrelated. Uh, Gaussians uh, without them being uh, independent. And I think there is even an example, there's even an example about this uh, here in the um, in set of exercises that you can end up in this, uh, in this mess pretty easily. I guess exercise 2.5 here, here you see the joint density 
And you can see this joint density, this is not jointly Gaussian, like because it doesn't look like that. There's absolute values floating around and it becomes zero at some point. So this is not jointly uh, Gaussian, but the problem is that X and Y individually, they are normals. And furthermore, they are even uncorrelated, but they are not independent. So this exercise here, this is, uh, this is an example of, of what I'm talking about here. This is exercise 2.5. This here is exercise 2.5 in Shreve 2. The questions on okay. And guys, I, I cannot read your mind. So if there's something that is not clear to you, you you gotta you gotta either ask the question uh, or write the question or ask me to repeat. I I I, I cannot read your mind. Okay, so we're slogging along. And um, so what we need to know now, if you want to use this property, I need to know that you're jointly Gaussian, right? So I need to know that y perpendicular and y are jointly Gaussian. So in our case, in our case, all of them, x, y, and y perpendicular, they are jointly Gaussian. This is because the linear combinations, A is a constant, because linear combinations of joint Gaussians uh, are again uh, joint Gaussians. So now it makes it easy to check for independence. So if I want to have independence, so independence is the same thing as asking for uh, zero covariance, right? So zero uh, covariance, this is, and this one here has mean, if I compute the expectation of my perpendicular, right? this is going to be the expectation of X minus a times the expectation of y, right? But this is zero and that's zero. So this is zero. So <clears throat> correlation, uh, you're sorry, covariance, this is just the expectation of, well, it'll be y, y perpendicular, right? And then I'll have to subtract away the mean of y times the mean of y perpendicular, but both of those are equal to zero. So I just need to work out what this one here is. And so what I'll do, this is what I want. This is the question mark. If I want to get independence between y and y perpendicular, I'll use the joint Gaussian. So I just need to check for a zero correlation, zero covariance. I get that this expectation here by plugging in what y perpendicular is, this is x minus a y. So this is equal to, it'll be the expectation of yx minus an a, that's a constant, you go up the side, and then y squared. So what is the expectation of x times y? Well, this is the correlation. Again, remember both x and y, they were given to be zero means, okay, zero means here. And then the correlation, uh, correlation and uh, covariance is the same because the, the variance, the individual variances are zero. So I'll just get rho here. First part, this is rho minus a, and then times the expectation. This is going to be the variance of y. This is a one. So if I want this to be true, if I want zero here on the left hand side, I need this thing to be zero. Okay, I solve for a. Solve for A. And I'm going to get that A is just rho. 
And so what that means is, so the random variable and uh, y perpendicular, which was x minus rho y, this random variable is independent of y. Don't be confused, there's a y here, but there's dependency between x and y, and it's when I subtract away this row y, I'm going to get exactly something that is independent of y because it has zero correlation. <clears throat> like this symbol here, this is independence. Okay, so we have we have now obtained what we wanted. Uh, we have obtained that we have decomposed it into these two parts. Part number one is independent, and part number two is measurable. What I do now is I can now compute. I can now compute what this conditional expectation is. So e of x given y. I plug in what x is. That x here is equal to x here is equal to uh, y perpendicular plus rho y given y. Right, and then I'll use it as linear. I'll use it as linear. So I can pull the row outside too, row is a constant. Right, now the independent, the independent, it doesn't matter what I get to observe. If, if I'm trying to estimate something given that I'm, um, given that uh, I have knowledge about, I observe y, but y has nothing to do with y perpendicular. The independence between the two things uh, means that I don't do any better than just computing the unconditional expectation. And over here, What's my best estimate of y when I get to observe y? Well, it's just going to be y. So here I have row y. And the expectation of y perpendicular, we already calculated. And I'm going to get row y here. So this is my function. So in this case, the conditional expectation of x given y, this is a function of y where uh, f of x is equal to row x. Professor? Yep. So are you seeing the expectation of uh, of y orthogonal is equal to zero? Yes. That was what we had up here. Right, so I take, oh, okay. take the expectation of this thing. This is equal to the expectation of this thing plus the expectation of this thing. I've got X has expectation zero and Y has expectation zero. So then the expectation of Y perpendicular is gonna be zero. Okay. Other questions for it? Should we be using a property here? This is a property that we're using. This here is um, so when you condition this here uses that y is independent of y perpendicular. That was the first one. And then it uses that if y is already measurable with switch to so condition on, y is sigma y measurable. So it uses these two properties. 
first property for the first part, second property for the second part. Okay, so the conditional expectation is a random variable, and it's a random variable to satisfy these properties that we had listed, these defining quantities over here. These two here. So what we have been doing in previous years has been to ask questions like, when does such a conditional expectation exist? What kind of properties does this conditional expectation here have? And so this year, we're trying to not go through all that material uh, and maybe do a few more examples on how to actually use it. But, but I can, let me at least mention some of the properties. There are, there are lots of properties that, that, that um, this conditional expectation have. Right, so it's uh, it's linear, okay. We've already used that, right? This is it's linear, right, so you can break up the expectation of a sum is equal to uh, the sum of the two conditional expectations, and so on. I mean, that's not particularly uh, surprising. I mean, just imagine what would happen if you didn't have the linearity of an expectation, then it would be kind of a weird world. Um, So let me list some more of them if I can find them. Yeah. If um, if uh, if um, if y is a g measurable, then the conditional expectation of x times y. So now we already. Given G, you already know what Y is. And then you can pull Y outside. Uh, there is a um, there is a um, a nesting property. It says that um, if I take something, if I take a sigma algebra that's inside G then I can first compute the conditional expectation of X given G and then condition on H. I can do the same thing. So here I'll have H and G next to each other. And the thing that wins is the smallest one. So this is just gonna be E of X given H. But this one here is particularly useful. This one here, has a, uh, this is just a note. Like you, when, when you look at omega and the empty set, take this to be your H. That's definitely inside G because G is a sigma algebra. And then we're gonna get that the expectation of the conditional expectation, the expectation of the conditional expectation, this is equal to the unconditional expectation. Because when we talk, we already talked about that when H is trivial, this is trivial. H is the trivial sigma algebra. When H is the trivial sigma algebra, then the conditional expectation is just the unconditional one. <clears throat> so we will have that the expectation of this estimate is the same. The expectation of the estimate is exactly the same as the uh, unconditional. Uh, expectation. Right. So the estimate. So the estimate. E of x given g. Has the uh, correct. Expectation. This is called um, in statistic. This property. Is called. Um, uh, uh, unbiased. Is the word unbiased estimator. This property is called uh, an unbiased. Uh, this property, I should say, I should say not called, it's referred to. It's referred to. Mm. 
referred to us referred to as an unbiased estimate. Yeah, so the conditional expectation has the correct uh, has the correct expectation, and we can, for example, see that in our example when we computed e of um, uh, what was it we had we had x given y. This was equal to rho y when x and y they were jointly normals. So if I take the expectation, so the expectation of the conditional expectation, right, that's going to be the expectation of rho y, and that was zero, and then also happens to be exactly the expectation of x. Right, so these two things coincided, as you should, by this general property that we had on top. Uh, another property is um, another property is uh, Jensen's inequality. You probably have seen this for um, for the unconditional expectation. So if you take if you take a function that is convex, then the conditional expectation of f of x given uh, g, I can pull f outside. I can pull if outside, and if I pull if outside, I'm going to get something that is bigger. So that's the instance inequality. <clears throat> it can sometimes be hard to remember uh, which way it should go. So just a just a note. This is a, this is just a trick to remember. Uh, which way, which way the inequality goes. <clears throat> so you know, you know that uh, you're sitting there doing the exam and you can't remember which one of these two is bigger? Is it this one or is it that one? You can't remember which of these two is the correct one. Okay, so here's the, here's the trick. You just try out f of x to be x squared. This one here is convex. Like, and you know that the variance of a random variable is given as the expectation of x squared minus the expectation squared. And then you also know that this variance, the variance of a random variable is always not negative. Right, so here you get that when the function is inside, right, this thing here, this is the expectation of f of x. Right, and this thing here, this is the expectation of x inserted into f for that particular, right? So we, you will now have that this number here by moving that to the other side, this one here is biggest. So the correct one, the correct one is the top one, not the bottom one. So if in doubt, you just plug in an example. And of course, this is going to like Jensen's inequality works for general convex function. It doesn't just have to be a square function. It just must have to be the square function. So, so Jensen work for all convex functions, and that includes, and that includes uh, 
So I'm looking at a put. So these are my case. This here is uh, the map that sends X into the maximum. You write it with pluses, right? So we write it with K minus X plus. It also works for calls. So these are puts. It works for calls. So this is X minus K positive part. Here's your K, right? These are also convex functions. And yes, since inequality applies. This is going to be useful in particular for uh, American options. So Jensen's Jensen is important uh, for uh, American options. And we're going to have American options probably after the midterm. We're going to talk a bit about American options. So, and then Jensen's inequality is going to play an important role. The last feature, the last feature here that I want to mention is um, something that comes up quite a bit, and it can be a little bit hard to grasp at first. Uh, just to give you an idea about how important this last feature is, it's actually in both our textbooks. Uh, I don't have the thin one uh, up here; I only have the thick one. But let me just show you the version. Uh, that's he's stating in the thick one. So you go over to the index and um, you can do that in the thin one as well. You look up the word uh, independence. Right? So this is down here at the bottom, page 73. So this is word independence number on page 73. This is, uh, this is also, as I said, in, in the other textbook, and it's this one here. It's this one here. And it's a long mess. This little result here, this is actually quite important. We use that, we are going to be using that a lot when we do calculations. Um, so let me state it and then we give you an example of how to use it in a specific case. The instance in your no, not instance, the independence number. So this is property number five. The independence lemma. It has inputs. So you take a function. This time the function goes from R2 to R. And the other thing you need is two random variables that are independent. So X is independent of Y. So those are your inputs. Then what happens is that when you compute the conditional expectation, you take the function, you apply it to X as well as Y, and out you get, out you get, and then you condition on one of the two, it's condition on Y, condition on Y. That conditional expectation can be computed. And the way that you compute it is you, you take out, the thing that you condition on. So you write here f of x comma y. But instead of the capital Y, you put in a little dummy. And then you compute the expectation without conditioning. But everywhere where you see capital Y, you put in the little y. And then when you're done, when you're done computing this expectation, now you're going to get something that depends upon little y. You replace that little y with the capital Y. So this notation here, this can seem a bit strange. Uh, the textbook writes this differently. Uh, he writes it in terms of yet another function. I don't want to do that. I like this notation here. What it says is that if I have independent random variables, I take out what is known. So that's the y variable. I replace it by a dummy, the little y. And then I just compute the unconditional expectation as I always do. And then after I'm done, I plug in I plug in the, uh, the random variable capital Y. And let me show you how this goes in some specific examples. Let me show you how it goes. So you can see how this notation works out in a specific example or two. Here is an old, here's an old exam. I don't know if you can see it. I can maybe move it up here a little bit. Um, 
this is an old midterm 2013 so years ago um, when we had written exams something like this is what you guys should expect to to be given but now we have all exams so a bit different but i would expect you guys to be able to solve a problem like this one um, with a little bit of practice so let's do the example together here's what we're going to do we're going to take two a two independent so x is independent of y x and y is standard normal right so you have mean zero variance one and then we're going to look at a new random variable. This is my Z. And I'm going to take Z to be the product. And then uh, your job is to compute, calculate, um, calculate the expectation of e to the a z and e to the a c given uh, one of the two uh, given say uh, y <clears throat> so this this is, we should be able to, so at this point, we should be able to do this. And um, so the first thing you note is that if I can calculate what this part here is, I can also calculate what this one here is, right? Because, because um, I know that this one here has the correct mean. So let's try to work out what it is. So it's a product is X times Y goes in here and condition on what Y is. So let's try to work out what this thing is. We're gonna start working out what this thing here is. So this is uh, E to the A Z given Y. This is the product, All right? So A here is a constant. is e to the x times y and then given y. And so now we're in the situation that we have a function. We're in this, it's made such that you have your independence lemma. We have a function of x and y. Here's the exponential function. The condition on one, well, the way that we should do it is we should replace what we condition on by a dummy. Okay, so I'll replace what I condition on by a dummy. e to the a and then it's an X. And then I replace what I condition on by a dummy. So this is a little Y. Okay. I compute this unconditional expectation. And then when I'm done computing it, I replace the dummy by the random variable. Okay, so I need to compute what I have in here. Right, so I have X is standard normal. We talked about the moment generating function see it was a moment generating function. This was a moment generating function for, uh, for a Gaussian. Does anybody remember what the moment generating function for the Gaussian was? Yeah, does anybody remember we had it last time? The mode range function for standard Gaussian. We need to take the coefficient. So the coefficient here is ay. We need to square the coefficient ay squared. And then we need to exponentiate it. And then there's a Gaussian, so there's always something with a half. 
So there's a half out there. And then when we're done computing, we can replace y, the dummy, with the random variable. Right, so now we're done. This here is equal to e to the one half a squared capital Y squared. Right, so that's the conditional expectation. And this is a random variable. It has to be measurable with respect to Y. So if I tell you what Y is, you need to be able to tell me what this is. And the answer is yes, right? So this here is my function, E of A, C, condition on Y. This is a function. Uh, f of y for f of x being e to the one half a squared x squared where x is and all Questions on this part? There was a little little bit that was left here calculate these two quantities. We got this one now, so we need this one. So we take expectation. We're gonna use that the expectation, the expectation of EAZ can be calculated as the expectation of the conditional expectation. So I have to compute this expectation. But now there's a square. And as we talked about last time, watch out for the squares. <laughs> watch out for the squares. The, uh, uh, the uh, troublemakers, when you have a Gaussian square, this is not going to be finite. Right? Um, right, so this is the moment unit function for this chi squared random variable. Right, so here you need, here you need, uh, you need. Uh, absolute value of y to be small and and you need uh, uh, to know uh, the um, the moment generating function uh, for um, y squared. So I won't take you through through all the details on this step here. Uh, we talked a bit about this uh, before that uh, moment generating functions they do not have this property that they are uh, always finite. And in particular for this example here, you will not have that. This thing here is going to explode. For example, uh, for example here when uh, when a is equal to plus minus one, this thing here is bad news. You're going to get explosion to plus infinity here. But this this number here is something that belongs to zero to infinity, but it includes infinity is included. Are there any any questions about this example here? You guys are very quiet. Are there any questions on this example? Not. Let me try. We have a little bit. We have a little bit of time. Let me do. Let me pull up uh, another example. So let me try to share a screen. These here were the problems we're looking at here. Those were midterm problems um, last year when we did all exams. And this year, your midterm problem is going to be based on homework. Uh, but last year I created a set of sample problems for the um, 
uh, we, we use for the oral exam. And let me flip down to, I had one in here, this one here. So there is, this one here is more complicated <laughs> to say the least. Um, this was a problem uh, that is very similar to the problem that, very similar, this is somewhat similar to the problem that you guys had done uh, on, um, in one of the one of the homework questions on Black's formula. So you have jointly normally distributed random variables x and y again. Um, and then first you've been asked to compute this expectation. So this is the Bechelet formula from, from um, one of the uh, one of the homeworks that you guys did, the one with simulation. But, and then the second part, part number two, this is the one that is tricky. Uh, you can see now that you're going to take the positive part, like this is this x plus. You're being asked to compute the conditional expectation of x plus given y. Like right, what we had done, what we had done in, as an example here was we had computed the conditional expectation of x given y. And now you're being asked to compute the conditional expectation of x plus given y. So this is this is quite a bit harder. And um, I suggest that we we end up this first part of the first part here of the lecture with um with showing you guys how to do that so we try to write all this out quite similar to the first first example we did page 12. so we try to write out all this stuff here. So this is another example, which we have again, X, Y, the standard normal. And one, one, row, row. Right, so here the goal is, so we did, we did the conditional expectation of X given Y. This was row Y. So now, what we want to do is to take the positive part here and then what is this equal to? And so just, you cannot just move, so you cannot, you cannot just move this plus outside. You cannot just move the plus outside. You cannot have that this is equal to. And the reason that you cannot have that, you cannot have this because, because of Jensen. Right. Jensen's inequality, Jensen's inequality, right? You have convexity here, the map the maps X into X plus, it's zero out here, and it goes up here. So Jensen's inequality, Jensen's inequality says that the expectation of X plus given Y, you know that there's gonna be a relation. If I put it out there, Jensen's inequality, this is a convex function, right? Because if I take any two points on the, uh, inside the domain, and the domain here is R, right? I combine, I combine these two points, with a straight line, then anywhere on the straight line, I'm at least on or above the function, right? And that's the case, then you have convexity. And yes, the inequality says that you're gonna get the biggest number. Remember the test example with the square function. You're gonna get this, and very likely you're gonna get a strict inequality. So you cannot just move this plus from the inside to outside. Please don't make such mistakes. This, this is not correct. So we did this one, but you cannot just say that this here is not gonna be equal to just row Y positive part, right? So, so in our case, uh, this part here, this would be row Y positive part. So whatever we calculate, whatever we calculate, what we have here on the left-hand side, is gonna be at least row Y positive part. But exactly what is it gonna be? Okay, so let me spend, let me spend uh, the, last, the last part of this uh, taking you through the solution.
So it's quite similar to what you had done in the homework. Um, let me try to show you. This is uh, this is similar. This is similar to a homework problem. <clears throat> this is we start out with um, we start out with calculating an unconditional expectation. So we start out by calculating beta x minus k uh, positive part. This is step one. That's the first part of the question. Calculate this, this piece here. This here is the Bachelet model. I think this was homework problem. Let me log it up. This was homework problem. So the one that you guys just did. Yes, this was the one that you guys just did. So this was homework number three. <clears throat> so you had played with simulation. Um, and the problem we're doing now is this one down here. Calculate the, um, the maximum. So this is a positive part of X minus K. Um, so we're solving this, this last part here now in the lecture. Let's try to solve it. All right, so as you guys are doing, you will move, you replace the plus up there with an indicator. So you'll have beta x minus k. I only need to worry about it when I'm in the money. So this is when beta x is bigger than k. And so I drop the plus and I put in the indicator. And then I use linearity. Then I use linearity, this is e and then it's beta x indicator beta x bigger than k and then minus a constant and then the indicator and so what we have here beta is again a constant so you can go outside this is beta outside. Then I know now that X is standard normal. So I can replace the integral, uh, the expectation by integral. Then I'll have my X times the indicator, beta X bigger than K, and then multiply onto the density. The one dimensional density is one over root two, two pi e to the minus X squared over two. That was the first part. And then the second part, the second part at my constant k outside. The expectation here, I can write this as an indicator. Beta is given to be, beta is given to be positive. K is an R, beta is positive. Okay, so if I divide through with Beta here, I'm not going to disturb the inequality. I'll have here that X is bigger than K over beta. So that's good. Now the first part, what can we do with the first part? We have my beta. Then there's an integral. This is an integral over R. I can do the same thing. I can integrate when X is big. So I can integrate from K over beta to infinity of x e to the minus x squared over two dx. And then the other one over here, this is minus k, then it's the probability that x is bigger than or equal to the expectation of an indicator is just the probability of the set. So the probability that x is bigger than k over beta. Now for the first integral, for the first integral, I need to, I need to integrate x times this, 
this Gauss function, there's a square root missing. There's one over square root two pi there. <clears throat> How would I do it? I need a function, so I'm gonna take the derivative I'm getting in this object here. So if I look at beta square root two pi outside an integral, so I don't wanna have the integral anymore. I wanna find a function. Function should be maybe minus e to the x squared minus x squared over two. Yeah, and then I'll have the lower bound is k minus beta. The upper bound is plus infinity. Like if I take the derivative of this function, I'm gonna get um, I'm gonna get the minuses will cancel out. I'm gonna get two x divided by two. I'm gonna get x down here, which is exactly what I wanted here. So that looks good. This one over here, this is equal to, here I have greater than or equal to, I can write this as one minus the probability that X is less than K over beta. You might worry about the equality sign here, but whenever I have a density function, the probability of being equal to something is zero. So it's okay for me to write equality signs here, both places. And then what do we have left here? We will have a coefficient beta over root two pi, plug in the top part. You're gonna get minus infinity, so that's a zero. And then it's minus minus, so this is an exponential, minus kappa over beta squared divided by two. And the other one, this is minus k, plus k and then the normal, dis uh, the normal distribution function. This is in the problem as well as in your homework. This was denoted by n of k over beta. So this here is the Bachelet formula. This is quite similar to Black's formula, but not quite. Not quite the same, but it's very similar. So that was the first step in the homework that had nothing to do with conditional expectations at all. So the conditional expectation part that comes in the second part. And it's of course related to the first part. That's why we, we walked through it. So now we have to do this one. And hopefully we can use the, the result that we just that we just derived. Hopefully we can use this formula. This formula here is what is denoted by uh, in the problem, let me switch it over so you can see it. So what we have done at this point, what we've done at this point is we worked out what this expectation here was. And it's denoted by, this was G evaluated at K comma beta. K is a real number, beta is positive. We figured out a formula for this thing. And we're using the standard normal distribution function, just the integral, integral of, the, uh, of the density. And now comes the, comes the new part, the harder part that was not in your homework, but the one we've been talking about today. We're gonna to be using the independence lemma to calculate this conditional expectation. Here. And it's hard because this plus is sitting inside there. But what we wanna do is we wanna be able to use the previous question because it has something that looks a lot like it. Let me try to work, work that one out. So step two. So step two. How should one go about doing this? Well, we'll do that decomposition that we had before. Step number two. We'll use, we'll use the uh, decomposition. We'll use the decomposition. So we will write here X, how was it? X was equal to uh, rho Y plus Y perpendicular. This was from before. And then what? 
then we will have um, the calculation in question was e of x positive part given y. Okay, so then we will write this out x plus, and I have to take the positive part of this thing e of rho y plus y perpendicular positive part given y. <clears throat> so it comes to place where we use the independence lemma. We're going to use the independence lemma. We're going to say that this here is equal to, we're going to say that this thing here is equal to, what do we do? We replace, we replace the variable that we condition on by a dummy. So this part here, this is the independence lemma. So this here will be E, and then we'll take rho Y. Take rho Y plus, and then we'll have Y perpendicular. The positive part given Y. Okay, so this is pretty close to the formula that we had before. The formula we had before. Oh. Independence lemma, there's no conditioning, right? Let's just compute the unconditional expectation, put y equal to capital Y. So this expression, this expression here is pretty close to what we had before. But we see the k here. This is going to be minus rho y. And then there's a beta, and then there's an x. X is y perpendicular, not quite because x was standard normal up here. Y perpendicular is not standard normal, but we know that. We know what do we know? We know, we know that x. We know that y perpendicular has a form. From up here, this is equal to x minus rho y. Right, so it has a mean zero. It's standard norm. It is normal, but we don't know what the what the mean and the variance is. So if we compute the mean, that was the one we had before. This was the expectation of x minus rho, the expectation of y. So that was my zero because these are both uh, zero random variables in mean. Now the variance. I also need the variance of y perpendicular. So the variance is equal to the mean, is equal to the expectation squared minus the mean, but the mean was zero, so I don't need to worry about it. I'll plug in what I'll have. So I'll have here x minus rho y squared. And I can factor out now. This is x squared rho squared y squared minus two rho x y nothing else and just factoring out the the square but what did I write I need this one squared this one squared and then two times that looks good and so what are all these variables in here the first mean this is a one the second one this is a rho squared the third one, this is minus two rho, and then the expectation of xy, this is going to give me another rho squared. I'm going to be here with one minus rho squared. So it's not standard normal. And uh, in the previous step here, in the first part, we used that x was standard normal. So we need to play a little bit with it. We need to play a little bit with it to get it to be exactly in the same form. What I'll do here, what I'll do here is I'll write an expectation and then I'll have rho y, the dummy. And so to get it to be standard normal, I need the, the variance to be one, right? So I'm dividing through with the standard deviation. So here I'll have, uh, it'll be square root one minus rho squared times y perpendicular divided by the square root of one minus rho squared. Like this quantity in there, this quantity here, and this one here is standard normal, mean zero variance one. And so now we can just read off, we can just read off 
this expectation here, this is equal to what was the notation we had? G and then K. K was a constant, so that was minus K here. So we need a G of minus rho Y. And then the second part, we have the beta. That was the square root of one minus rho squared. And then we need to plug Y equal to capital Y. I can do that in one step here, to save a little space. So this here is a capital Y. So this is my conditional expectation of X positive part given Y. And you can see it is a lot more complicated. It's a lot more complicated uh, to, to what we had done in the first step. And the reason that it's a lot more complicated is because we have this nonlinear function that we're applying inside. So this plus here is a nonlinear function and uh, it, it, it becomes a lot more involved to figuring out what the conditional expectation is, but nonetheless, and we did succeed in the end, we have a closed formula for G and we just evaluated that function at minus rho times the random variable Y and then and your other part. Always make sure that the function that you end up with, this is just a function applied to the random variable that you condition on. Any questions to all the examples, including the last one that we have done this morning? There are no questions, then um, we're gonna take a little break. And then after the break, we will um, we will switch over, switch gears. Uh, we'll do, uh, do something about default risk, uh, look at um, standard CDS contracts and, and maybe something with baskets. Okay, so take a 10, 15 minute break and then um, get on the other Zoom link and I'll see you in a bit.